Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me, <clears throat> taking time away from your family, and uh, maybe you're sitting back enjoying a, you know, a beverage and a meal. I'm, I'm still waiting to get home after a long day of work. It's 6 o'clock out here on the West Coast. But I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to join me to talk a little bit about impressions and things we can do maybe to make our lives a little bit easier. Uh, you know, simplifying the process with anything possible can always be a win-win for us and the patients. Uh, so with that being said, we could talk about impression techniques for many, many hours and go into you know, details on materials. So I tried to pick some of the key points that I feel are very beneficial to anyone doing dentistry, whether you're recently out of school or been out for many years. Some things to look back on as far as um, bread and butter techniques, traditional standards that maybe are being missed in many of the things we're doing. And some new products and techniques that may make life a little easier in addition. So with that being said, we've got about an hour here to discuss some of the different things happening in impressions currently in dentistry. And so they talk a little bit about uh, my background. As you can see here, a lot of different things that I've done over the years and, and I'm still growing and, and changing everything I do in my practice you know, weekly, uh, as many of you are. So hopefully I can shed some light on some interesting aspects of the impression skills in dentistry. So let's think about what goes into having a, a successful impression. There's a lot of different things involved. But I picked out what I would say are, are three of the main uh, ingredients. Uh, first one being preparation design. Obviously, if you have a great preparation design, it's going to make life that much easier for you, for your materials to flow over the, um, the, uh, the prepared tooth, and for the laboratory to be able to read and distinguish where those margins are. Uh, tissue management is another key point. We'll spend a fair amount of time talking about this. Uh, as far as fluid management, hemostasis, and tissue displacement. Let's face it, I think that's the, probably the most challenging portion of taking any impression is this one component. The third component, which is also key, is the impression technique. How we implement material onto the tooth itself, what type of delivery apparatus we're using, uh, the types of trays involved, if we're using different types of trays, what can make life easier, what can make things more challenging. We'll talk about some of the pros and cons of those different products as well. So I think these are three main ingredients uh, that would contribute to a successful impression. Now the first thing, as I mentioned, the first key ingredient being preparation design. Let's think of margin placement. There's obviously a lot of different ways to go. And um, you can see that by the roadmap here that you know we have many choices. And so I'm not here to say you have to do one way. I'm here to enlighten you on many different things that are possible. Obviously, with modern ceramics being as wonderful as they are to give us beautiful aesthetics without having to mask metal, they've made life very easy for us. And the reason they've done that is because we can keep margins super gingival quite regularly without having any cosmetic concerns. So if you look at the photo on the lower left-hand side, you'll see a traditional MOL inlay followed by a crown, and followed by an onlay. Now you'll notice the margins of these vary anywhere from super gingival to equal gingival to sub -gingival. Now obviously this impression is going to be very easy to pick up three uh, indirectly fabricated restorations with one impression simply because of the margin placement. And looking at this you probably don't even need to pack cord in order to capture a very good impression of this. So that's one of the wonderful attributes of using modern ceramics and pretty much mainstream impression materials that are available today can take a, an adequate impression of this very easily. And uh, there was a recent uh, journal entry uh, clinician's report, CR's newsletter, uh, their current edition, talked about the, the findings of various impression materials that they tested and pretty much every material tested currently that we use in dentistry was rated as excellent by them and conformed to the ADA specifications. So to some extent, it wasn't, uh, it's not about the impression material you use so much as what your preference is in impression materials. And so we'll talk a little bit about impression materials as we move forward. But you know, with, with margins like this, any impression material is obviously going to work. Now, when you look at the picture on the lower right-hand side, you'll see that obviously we have an interior crown, a lot more con you know, concern over aesthetics. Uh, we're burying the margins subgingively, probably because an existing restoration was already present. Uh, hence the amount of reduction under the gum line. In the case of this impression, it's going to be a lot more challenging simply from the standpoint of the margin placement. However, in preparing this tooth, you can see that the uh, dentist has done a very good job of maintaining tissue integrity 
without causing any collateral damage. So by not having bleeding, they've already you know, created a lot better scenario for a excellent impression. Uh, but obviously it's going to be more challenging having to use various types of retraction techniques to get the tissue out of the way so that impression material can uh, pass into the sulcus past the uh, cable surface margin of the preparation. So when we think about preparing two structures, I think oftentimes we, many of us as dentists just go in and start preparing with our favorite diamond. Uh, think for a moment, what is the direction that you like your handpiece to go when reducing tooth structure? You know, some of us go clockwise, some go counterclockwise. And so my question to you, based on the direction in which you're moving, is are you trying to reduce a lot of tooth structure quickly, or are you trying to do minimal amounts of tooth reduction, maybe at the margin? And so what I want you to think about is the direction of pre preparation of tooth structure. So if your burr is rotating in a clockwise fashion and your handpiece is moving in a clockwise fashion, what you will find is that burr is actually rotating in such a direction that can cause damage to the tissue and less reduction to the tooth structure. So you'll notice here, a prep in a clockwise direction, the tissue removal is due to burr rotating in the opposite direction, and rolling on the tooth creates less reduction of tooth structure. Now, when might this take place? This probably occurs at your margin when you're trying to do finessing of the margin, doing minimal reduction and smoothing. And so in doing so, you're moving in a clockwise direction. But unfortunately, you're risking causing collateral damage to tissue because of the burr's rotational aspect moving against the tissue in a less than desirable fashion. And had you maybe done a counterclockwise reduction at the margin, you would have seen less tissue damage because the burr would actually be rotating in the direction of tissue that it's moving, so it's rolling on the tissues. But you'd find that you get more aggressive tooth reduction from the burr on the, the tooth. And so my best analogy for this to make it a little more easy to understand is if you have a bicycle and you pick up the front end of the bicycle and you roll that tire forward. And as it's rolling forward while being held in the air, you walk forward with that bicycle and then set it down on the ground as you are walking. In doing so, you find the tire continues to roll on the concrete. Now, this would be the case of preparing in a clockwise fashion. The burr is rotating the same direction as the tissue, and so you're not getting damage to the tissue. Uh, sorry, I meant counterclockwise. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. And so the opposite would hold true of your burr. If you're cutting on the tooth structure, would be in the case of the bicycle. If you pick the front of the bicycle up, rotating the burr, or sorry, the rotating the wheel backwards while still walking forward, when that bicycle hits the ground, that tire which is rolling backwards, once it hits the ground, it's going to stop and instantly start rotating the opposite direction. Well, your burr can't stop and start rotating the other direction when it hits tissue. It's going to start doing a gingivectomy or gingival plasty. You're going to start damaging tissue, which is going to cause bleeding, which is going to make you know, the impression technique a little more challenging. So think about your direction of preparation when you're moving your handpiece around the tooth. So again, prepping counterclockwise is favorable for causing less tissue damage and faster reduction to tooth. Prepping clockwise by moving the handpiece clockwise, you get more tissue damage and less reduction to tooth. Now, the nice thing about burr rotation is for those of you using electric handpieces, you can change the direction of movement anytime you want with forward or reverse. So electric handpieces become very desirable when preparing margins at the gum line so that you're not damaging the tissue. For those of you using air-driven uh, handpieces, you want to make sure that you think about the direction in which you're moving. From there, the other thing you can do is place a single cord, like a double zero or zero retraction cord. And so in placing that retraction cord, you can get that gingival tissue to displace half a millimeter to sometimes a millimeter, allowing you to refine that margin without getting near the tissues. So that's another way in which you can keep yourself from having problems. Now, as I mentioned, electric hand pieces are phenomenal. If you're not using one currently and you're in the market, I would highly recommend taking a look at uh, the various ones that are on the market. I personally use Cycan and Cavo, but obviously b and Air and ADEC and many other companies uh, have products out there as well. The nice thing about them is they have the ability to change the RPMs at a moment's notice. So on my system, as you can see here, I have various presets. 
uh, anywhere from 2,000 rotations per minute to 200,000 rotations per minute based on what I'm trying to accomplish. Whether it's cutting off an existing zirconia restoration, whether it's doing gross uh, reduction to tooth structure for a crown, or maybe doing fine margin reduction at say six to 8,000 revolutions per minute uh, with high levels of torque to remove tooth structure but put a very nice fine margin on there without being uh, uh, too aggressive in, in controlling the, the burr speed. So nice to be able to, to dial that in. Now we're all using various types of diamond burrs. I happen to be using Brassler and SS White and Axis for many things, but this is my, my preparation kit that I use the majority of time for reducing tooth structure. And I use this in my electric handpiece, the same as you could use in a uh, traditional air turbine. What I want to point out with these is since they're round and they spin in our burrs, they obviously can cause some damage to the tissues if not used properly. So if you are using a air-driven handpiece, one of the things I would say in addition to your current burr system like I'm showing here is to maybe look at one of these devices. And this device is very interesting. This happens to be from Comet. This is the SF1LM. It's a sonic handpiece or an ultrasonic uh, scaler as you might think of in the hygiene department. It has a few different settings to change the, the rate in which the vibration or oscillation is occurring. And so the way this device works is quite unique and very interesting. You're seeing a lot of this now in the European journals and a lot of South American journals and a little bit occasionally in America. Um, I've been using it for a number of years now and I couldn't say enough wonderful things about it. So you'll notice on the left hand side there's numerous different inserts. These inserts are really no different in shape than your existing diamonds. You have knife edge diamonds here, you have small chamfer, large chamfer, you have shoulder burrs, and you also have two very interesting burrs down at the lower right hand corner which you can see here. These burrs, actually three, these burrs are interesting in that they have a diamond coating on one half of it and it is round just like a burr. The other half of it is cut away and flat so it's almost like you have a burr that's been cut in half. Where this comes into play is maybe working on lower anteriors or tight interproximal areas or maybe even veneer preparations where you want to go interproximally but you don't want to damage the adjacent tooth. You don't want to cause atrogenic trauma. And so these burrs work phenomenal. Put a nice margin without damaging the adjacent tooth structure. Uh, furthermore, you can use any of these burrs down at the gum line. And so the reason that I think these are very impressive at the gum line is since they just uh, vibrate back and forth, they actually don't cause any tissue trauma. So in utilizing them, you can go subgingival or equigingival, touching the gum tissue and not cause bleeding in the same fashion you would with the traditional rotary uh, handpiece, whether it's electric or uh, air, air driven. So gross reduction other than the margin you might do with your traditional handpiece and then pick this one up to do your fine margin refinement, uh, which I do quite regularly um, along veneer preparations. But uh, again, electric hand pieces have been my favor more recent years just because of their ability to have high torque at very low speeds. But both are phenomenal tools based on what you're using in your practice. So here's a patient that presented my office as a new patient. They had existing veneers and somehow they had broken one off. And so they had a piece still attached. You can see the margin is a little super gingival, uh, probably just due to recession with time. So you can see the margin right in here. And so we want to lower it down to the gum line or slightly subgingival. But we got to clean off all the existing... Uh, debris as well as um, moving the margin and taking off any adhesion that's still uh, stuck on the tooth. So you'll notice here I'm going in with this particular chamfer uh, insert and I'm removing tooth structure as well as resin and refining that margin, dropping the margin subgingively. Would I take off an entire veneer with this or would I prepare an entire tooth with this? No, I typically wouldn't. It would take too long, uh, but you could. And so from that standpoint, this has a wonderful ability to refine margins uh, at the gum line or below. And my best analogy for this would be if you've ever had a cast or a family member's had a cast, you've had a hard plaster cast that needs to come off and the doctor comes at you with a very interesting saw that makes a lot of noise and oscillates back and forth and will cut through that hard plaster cast. But once it gets down to the tissue, it won't damage your tissue. Uh, reason for that being is obviously they can't tell exactly when they're breaking through the cast and they don't want to you know, cut someone's arm or limb. So this device I would say is very analogous to that because of the ability for this to just oscillate or vibrate back and forth that you can touch the gum tissues without causing any collateral damage. 
Now let's face it, if someone comes in your practice and has very bad tissues, for example, this type of individual, obviously if you go in and touch these tissues with anything, maybe even just blowing air on them, you'll probably find some bleeding. So I can't say that the, the uh, sonic uh, preparatory handpiece here, this uh, SF1LM uh, from Comet, is going to work for every patient. They have to have healthy tissue to begin with. But if you do have healthy tissue, you will not cause collateral damage. Um, so that leads me right into tissue management. So if we're doing great preparation designs and we're trying to manage the tissues by not causing damage, then that makes it even easier for us to move to the next step. So periodontal tissue management, obviously, as I mentioned in the, in the oncoming slide, that you need to address it before the patient gets to your chair. And if they are in your chair, then maybe you know, you need to do something different to manage those tissues so that you have an easier chance of getting a good impression. So if we can avoid trauma, if we can get the patient's mouth healthier before they see us, that's obviously going to reduce bleeding and make our life that much easier to take a final impression. So if someone like this is in your practice and needs restorative therapy, obviously you want to send them over to the hygiene department, get them cleaned up using various types of scaling and root planing, lasers, various types of medications, etc. Once they're healthy, then you can bring them back to the chair and do a great job Tissues will have receded and be a lot easier to manage. Plus, cosmetically, you'll get a better looking restoration because of the tissues being uh, more uh, consistently placed and healthy versus potentially sloughing or, or retracting due to inflammation irritation. Now, obviously, some patients come into the practice with broken teeth or need immediate treatment, and that's fine. These things happen. It's just going to be more challenging to treat. And for some of those cases, maybe we just provisionalize them and send them on their way to the hygiene department. Or if we know someone has a problem, we will sometimes get out a ultrasonic or piezo, clean the couple teeth that are in question, give them a periodontal rinse, and uh, send them home with a, a prescription medicated rinse, and let them come back in a couple days, and usually it makes our life that much easier. So a lot of things we can do to manage tissues ahead of time that can make life easier. When we think of tissue management, it, it's a huge part of taking final impressions. As you can see by some of the research here, um, one of which done by Gordon Christensen. He, he mentioned that 90% of impressions have defects when they're sent to the laboratory. Another one in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry was mentioning that 89% of impressions had visible errors when sent to the lab. And even Detola, Mike, Mike Detola had uh, mentioned recently in one of his articles uh, how many problems they see with impressions uh, coming from the dentist. And that's part of the reason we wanted to have this discussion tonight was to talk about some things to make life better for us, better for the patients, and better for the laboratory technicians. So looking here at many of the problems that arise uh, when you send an impression off to the laboratory, the, the number one problem they found in impressions was there were voids or tears along the finish line. From there, the next thing they found was a putty exposure through the wash. Uh, so we didn't have good orientation of materials onto the tooth. From there, air bubbles along the finish line was another 40%. Uh, pressure of the tray onto soft tissue, tray didn't fit properly or was malpositioned, that's about 38%. Followed by inadequate retention of material to the tray at 33%. Uh, there are not many people that are using it tray adhesives, but they are highly recommended and certainly very advantageous. Uh, so that's part of the reason why we're seeing inadequate retention of material to the trays, as well as more people using closed bite trays. From there, some flow problems. We'll address some of these in the uh, troubleshooting later on in the program. And the final one being retraction cord attached to impressions at a 6%. So in seeing these numerous different errors, we're going to talk about all of these and how they occur and maybe things we can do to avoid these. So tissue management, obviously we're trying to control hemostasis as well as fluids from cellular fluid and saliva while at the same time displacing tissue to allow our materials to successfully go past the cable surface margin and encompass the emergence angle of the root structure to give that laboratory technician the best chance of making a great restoration. And so if you're not using various types of anti-sialagogues prior to appointments or large quadrant dentistries or full arch dentistry, you're really missing out. You know, whether you're using uh, a sim simple uh, Benadryl antihistamine, or if you're moving into salter salterpene or propantholine or other types of anti-sialagogues, uh, they pay huge dividends, whether it's one tooth or a full arch, highly recommend these. Uh, from there, well, well, one more thing, you can get people so dry with these that you actually don't even need saliva ejectors and cotton rolls. So 
a huge advantage to having these for those patients that are, are capable of utilizing them. But, uh, you know, obviously using various types of cotton rolls, various types of uh, saliva ejectors. You know, there's a lot of different things on the market that we have to use to get rid of the saliva, which is the easiest part of management. But moving on from the easiest, the next more difficult one being curricular fluids. Well, fluids can be controlled with one of two things very easily, either the anticyalogogues or something like a laser. You can utilize a laser in the, uh, in the uh, sulcus around the tooth to very easily shut down the lymphatic system so you're not getting any curricular fluid seepage into your retraction cord or up onto your margins. So we'll talk about lasers in a moment, but curricular fluid, I'd say, was the second easiest to handle. And really the most challenging one being bleeding. A lot of different products on the market to help us with bleeding. Why are there so many? Because I'd say not one product out there can really manage it consistently day in and day out. And I think that's part of the reasons we see so many. So in achieving hemostasis with bleeding being that it's the most difficult thing to handle, we obviously need to somehow shut down the blood vessels, whether it be by uh, using lasers or electrosurge or radiosurge to literally cauterize them, or to use various types of chemotherapy to try and uh, clog the end of the capillary or blood vessel, or using pressure to help control bleeding. Uh, and so there's been a lot of different types of pressure devices out there as well. And any one of these can work on any given day or every day based on how you use them. But I would say I want a level of consistency or success that I'm guaranteed without having to think about it or having numerous different products to run to. So let's look at some of the different things on the market. Chemotherapy, the astringents, that's the, the number one thing out there that most of us are using for controlling bleeding. We have epinephrine, aluminum chloride, ferric sulfate, alum, aluminum acetate, zinc chloride. Some people would say hydrogen peroxide as well. Um, so there's different products on the market. Let's look at each individual one. Uh, I would say, you know, this picture here highlights where you don't want to use a ferric sulfate product simply because of the iron oxidizing over time if it's not been washed away thoroughly. And because of that, you can get some cosmetic problems. And so I would stay away from that in the anterior dentition unless you are very thorough at rinsing the entire mouth out. So let's look at the different products. Epinephrine. We can use these very well. We know they're a good vasoconstrictor. Uh, we can go ahead and utilize anesthetics. In the case of this one, you can see some lidocaine with epinephrine, 1 to 50,000. We can go ahead and place this right next to the sulcus or in the sulcus and get some phenomenal uh, anesthesia or paresthesia, or, or, sorry, uh, anesthesia in uh, uh, hemostasis. And uh, if you use too much of it, the downside is you can cause necrosis to the tissues, whether it's the papillary tissues interproximally or causing gingival sloughing on the facial based on the the type of biotype you're involved with, uh, the thickness and thinness of tissue. There's a lot of things you can do if you're not careful with this. But that being said, it's a great product that can work extremely well. Many of us at one point or another may have actually dipped our cords into uh, epinephrine-based solutions to then pack into the sulcus, which can help also. We know that really the only downside of this is causing necrosis to tissue or systemic effects such as anxiety, tachycardia, tremors, hypertension, etc. So Great products to use, but I wouldn't say it's something that works for every case. So moving to an, another type of product that works, I would say, a little bit better is aluminum chloride, which this particular product is probably one of the most widely used agents, not only from an application of liquid, but also in many of the different types of pastes, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, you can impregnate the cords or apply it topically. In this particular example, you can see this is alternates product. And they have some wonderful brush tip applicators that allow you to scrub it into the capillaries very easily uh, to get uh, hemostasis. The only downside of this is it can cause some irritation to the tissues, which over a day or two uh, sometimes uh, it can take to heal. But for the most part, it, it's not that bad on tissues. This is typically something I use in the anterior dentition when I need hemostasis. Um, you can go ahead and leave this in the sulcus for up to 15 minutes without permanent damage. If you're leaving it longer than that, uh, you might have some problems. So be cognizant of that when you're using this and or any astringent. Uh, ideally, research has shown you know, the less chemicals you throw at the tissue, the better off you are as far as maintaining that tissue in its same position. Uh, but obviously, we need various types of astringents uh, throughout the process. So using the least amount possible that creates the desired effect is really what we're going for. One other negative effect for using aluminum chloride is if you don't rinse it off well enough, 
you can have some distortion or inadequate setting with your vinyl polysiloxide impression materials. So again, make sure you're rinsing things off very, very well. And if you have cords that have been pre-impregnated, I would say to some extent you might want to either make sure they're rinsed off well and dried and repositioned more apically in the sulcus, or sometimes taking them out and placing a new cord that is not impregnated and dry might be a good way to go as well. Um, simply because your impression material, if it's touching that cord and it's impregnated, you're going to get some distortion along that. Looking at ferric sulfate, this particular one again from Ultradent, I feel they have great astringent products. Uh, really recommend uh, their products highly if you need an astringent. Uh, the problem with ferric sulfate, as I mentioned earlier, is a cosmetic dilemma. If you're not rinsing it away thoroughly, you'll get the iron to actually oxidize. It'll change color, leaving that black mark. And if that's on your margin or under your ceramic restoration, unfortunately, that will be a, uh, a problem for the patient. And it may you know, relate to a redo or a, a replacement procedure on your part. So something to think about. This uh, can also be irritating and or corrosive at high concentrations. But I would say it has a very rapid effect, maybe even a faster onset based on its concentration than aluminum chloride. So typically in the back of the mouth where we're seeing more gum disease and more bleeding and more problems, this is the go-to product in the back of the mouth for me with the aluminum chloride being more of a go-to product in the front of the mouth. Uh, so again, be careful of it causing staining to the tooth and or tissues. From there, you can move into numerous different pastes. These have been uh, more prevalent in the last oh, eight years, I would say. Uh, I think 3M, or not 3M, uh, Kerr coming out with their Exposil being one of the first ones, which is basically a, a kaolin clay and aluminum chloride, and as it absorbs moisture from circular fluids, uh, it expands. So clay expands upon uh, taking in water. And so the expansion that it's capable of achieving works well in loose tissues, but on very tight tissues, you don't get much displacement. So I would say it works well sometimes and not very well on other instances. Uh, so again, any of these pastes, can do a decent job depending on the type of tissue and depending on the depth of the sulcus. But I can't say that there's anyone here uh, that I would use consistently on a day in and day out basis knowing it's going to work every time. Now that being said, they have gotten better. You know, 3MSB's got a nice product. Premier has their Traxident, which is great also. Um, a lot of these oftentimes need various types of copper caps and things to help press on the tissues and on the material. I don't like putting any additional pressure on my tissues whenever I can avoid it. Uh, I like to do the least amount of pressure possible and the least amount of astringents so that tissue stays intact. So another point to think about is this is an additional overhead. They're usually a little more expensive. And uh, again, I don't think they displace tissue as well as traditional cords. So I'm not as much of a fan as these, but they can work. And uh, uh, they do have a time and place in which they could be implemented. So if we're looking at cords, which I think is still one of the main things that most of us are using, as you know, depending on how you're placing these, you can cause inflammation and or tissue damage based on how you're placing them and or the size of cord you're placing. So based on pace, based on uh, various types of astringents, based on cords, all of these can cause recession. I would say that one that can cause recession the most readily is how you pack your cord. Uh, now, obviously, in packing the cord, you can pre-impregnate these. I typically say that if you use a basic cord that's non-impregnated and you're not heavy-handed in breaking the periodontal fibers and attachments to the tooth, you can place these pretty easily and not get much bleeding or no bleeding at all. And should you start to find bleeding, you can always apply some type of astringent on top or let it run its course and let it coagulate on its own while you're doing your preparation. Because if you place your cord at the beginning of your preparation, you have plenty of time for that to coagulate on its own without putting in more chemicals. And that's why I think placing the cord at the beginning of your preparation is more desirable than placing it once you have everything prepared and you're expecting cord to retract tissues in two to three minutes. So in the case of this particular patient, you can see we have two very conservatively prepared anterior teeth. We have our margins equigingival. This is a great time to use a single cord because of the type of tissue we have here. I don't want to use a double cord technique. Uh, I rarely, almost never use a double cord uh, technique in the anterior dentition simply because of the type of tissues that are there that I don't want to cause a cosmetic problem for myself and the patient by trying to pack extra cords in there and displace more tissue than necessary. So in using one cord, I can go ahead and drop my margin another half a millimeter uh, so I know it will be subgingival. And by not putting a lot of astringents in there and double cord packing and paste and all kinds of other things, 
I find that I get healthier tissues that rebound quite quickly after removing this cord. Now, if this cord is displaced under the gum line far enough, I can go ahead and take an impression and leave that single cord in. Other times, we'll go ahead and take the cord out. One of the big things to consider here is when you're taking that cord out, to make sure it is extremely wet when you remove it. The reason you want that wet is so that you don't get an epithelial tear from the cord being attached to the tissue in the sulcus. And if you do find that you're getting bleeding after having retrieved the cord, if you go ahead and grab those various types of astringents or paste, uh, or maybe even a laser, as we'll talk about in a moment, you should be able to control that fairly easily and quickly uh, with the single cord technique in the anterior dentition. This is where I find the double cord technique works best in my hands. Let's face it, we have a lot more tissue to move around in the back of the mouth. Recession isn't as much of a concern as it is in the anterior dentition. This is where I think a two cord technique shines. It's not to say you can't use it in the front of the mouth. You certainly can. Just need to be very careful with how you implement it. And I personally find in my hands, I don't need to use it in the front of the mouth. So with a two cord technique, typically a pocket greater than three millimeters in size, you're going to place that double zero or triple zero or maybe even a, a single zero cord first. Do your gross preparation going down and finally refining your margins. And then after doing this, you're going to apply your, your second cord. That second cord typically being a size one, two, or three. And in placing that cord on top, you want to give it time, maybe a good eight to 10 minutes to displace tissue. By displacing tissue laterally as well as gingivally, uh, you can retrieve this one cord and have typically no bleeding simply because there was a, a, a cord in there prior to this cord going on top of it. You typically don't find bleeding unless patient's tissues are extremely irritated from either burr strikes or not having healthy gums when you started the process. So I don't feel again that you need astringents in the cord, but they do make cords obviously that are pre-impregnated should you want them. Again, I like less chemicals personally. So here's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to move this tissue away from our gingival margin to allow us room to capture that uh, emergence angle from the root structure. You'll notice on the left-hand side, a single cord technique doesn't displace anywhere near the same amount of tissue as a double cord technique, which is on the right side of the screen. But you'll also notice the compression of the ligaments that attach the tooth and gum tissue together above the bone. They're not compressed as heavily as compared to a double cord technique. So that double cord technique can cause irreversible tissue damage and attachment problems based on how you place that cord and how hard you're pushing on the second cord behind it. Now, hopefully you get more displacement laterally to the gingival tissues, but you will get some displacement gingivally or apically. So be careful of that when you're using a double cord technique. And this is why I really try to avoid this in the anterior dentition, just to minimize my risk of a cosmetic problem when I want to deliver those restorations a few weeks later. So again, double cord technique for me personally in the back of the mouth, single cord in the anterior dentition. And as you'll notice on the left-hand side, if you leave a single cord in and it's down far enough, you can leave a single cord in without ever packing a second cord on top and take an impression with that cord in place. And should you need to remove that cord because you don't have enough distance from cord to margin, then just make sure you have some type of astringent there to help remove the small capillary bleedings. To take it a step further, I'd mentioned lasers earlier. Obviously, AMD, uh, Denmat, Cavo, numerous different companies have lasers on the market. I would say, AMD's laser and Denmat's laser is very small, portable, convenient, and uh, very inexpensive to own and operate. Highly recommend looking into these types of products. You'll notice here this patient walks in with a broken cusp. We've probably all had this in our practices. And there's extra tissue that needs to be removed. Now, we can go in there with a scalpel, electrosurge, radiosurge. We can cut it away with a diamond. Uh, but in using most of those, you're typically going to contend with a little more bleeding and a few more issues. Let's face it, if I've got to remove tissue, I don't want to have to be packing a cord and managing bleeding. So the fastest and most efficient way to accomplish that nowadays is using a laser. And so if you're not using a laser currently, it's kind of like for those of you that have magnification, if someone took away your magnification, your loops, it would be very difficult to practice once you are accustomed to wearing loops every day. Well, lasers are the same. If you're not used to them, you don't realize what you're missing. But once you've had one, if someone were to take it away from you, you'd realize how difficult dentistry can be by not having one. So a patient like this, in a matter of a minute or less, I can cut away this excessive tissue. I can gain exposure to any aspect of the tooth, giving myself visual uh, capabilities to see my margin and refine it. 
any bits of bleeding that could have arisen from removing tissue have been avoided simply because a laser can shut down the lymphatic system and the capillaries. So I have a perfectly clean environment in which to work to take my impression so that I don't need to implement any pace, cords, or astringents. Furthermore, when it comes time to deliver my restoration, the temporary restoration down here might have irritated the gum tissue and had bacterial buildup which would cause irritated inflamed tissue. Well, with any other device or, or procedure, you would have inflammation and problems. With a laser, bacterial colonization can't happen for at least 30 days, sometimes longer. Uh, so you actually have healthier tissue from having used a laser than any other technique we have in dentistry. So the laser, the way in which we're utilizing this is to create the same amount of space we would have obtained by using a single cord or double cord technique. And based on how you implement a laser, you can make very small amounts of tissue vaporized or removed to allow access, or you can take away a lot of tissue based on you know, what you're trying to accomplish. And part of it goes into technique, part of it goes into the size of the fiber. The diameter of the fiber, just like picking up a bird, you can have very narrow fibers or very wide fat fibers. And so based on the size of the fiber, you can remove a lot of tissue or minimal tissue. And so in looking at this particular patient, you can see they have a lot of hypertrophied tissue after having a root canal procedure and a core buildup. You know, maybe they didn't come back to the practice for a while. Things are broken down and you need to manage all that tissue. Well, I think we've all tried managing that with cords at one point in our career, and we know that's going to be a nightmare. So to go in here in just a matter of a couple minutes to vaporize tissue, to give us access to margins so we can see what we're doing and make sure things are clean and clear, certainly makes life easier. And let's face it, all of us have had these types of problems where managing bleeding becomes an issue. And so again, to have a device like a laser, nothing else compares. So I highly recommend looking into lasers to make your life easier. From there, if we look at various types of impression trays, if we've managed the bleeding in fluids, we need to look at the type of tray system we're going to use on top of this. Now, closed bite trays can be used for various instances, as we'll talk about in a moment. They have wonderful uh, aspects that can be used and other side effects that really should be avoided. So the problem with closed bite trays are many. Number one being they lack rigidity, which can cause distortion. They can actually spring back after taking an impression, which causes a, a change in the shape of the impression. You don't have cross arch stabilization. So if you're trying to you know, maintain good occlusion, sometimes you won't be able to obtain that if you don't have the adjacent dentition. If you have thin spots or perforations, you can get distortions as well. We know that impression materials shrink towards their mass or the bulk. So we know with these large amounts of material, it's going to shrink towards the center more so. We know that we are unable to recreate excursive movements by using this type of technique. Hence, we see more crowns nowadays, more than ever, being very flat and not very lifelike, simply because of not being able to create the same type of anatomy that a tooth should have, uh, because of not knowing excursive and protrusive functions. So in looking at numerous different types that are on the market, uh, some of the things we need to think about is when we're implementing them. Uh, the indications for a closed bite tray would be one to two prepared teeth. We want the tray to fit behind the tuberosity without impinging on tissues. We want the patient to have a class one or class two dentition. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever tooth we've worked on, that there is a non-prepared tooth on either side of it. And we want to make sure we have good occlusal stops. So obviously the contraindications would be the opposite of that. More than two teeth prepared in an arch. Uh, the most distal tooth in the arch ideally is a contraindication as well. Class three occlusion inadequate space for the tray to actually fit, no natural occlusal stops, and an exaggerated curve of speed, obviously because the tray will be distorted based on that exaggerated curve of speed. So on the lower right is one type of tray. I showed you some other ones earlier from another manufacturer. They're typically plastic. They have a lot of capabilities to distort and flex. I would tell you if you are using impression trays of this type to maybe look at some other ones out there. I, I showed you one example here from Triodent, which is distributed by Ultradent currently. These rigid metal trays are autoclavable and reusable, and all you do is replace the small mesh insert internally. Uh, so it makes them quite nice. I have yet to see anything as rigid as these. I would say Clinician's Choice makes a nice metal one also that's pretty rigid, um, but I think these are the best in my mind. If you notice the mesh here, notice how the mesh has some slop or play in it. Okay, they fabricated them these this way on purpose. Compared to most systems, you'll see there is no play in the mesh. When a patient bites down into this mesh, the first thing that's going to happen is the plastic on the side is going to want to be pulled in because of the bite pressure. That's going to cause instant distortion. 
knowing that this type of system makes it such that you don't have that type of error occurring. So that's one huge benefit to these. Um, the other thing is very inexpensive to implement because they're replaceable uh, inserts. So you're not buying a, a new uh, closed byte tray every time. So let's look at closed byte trays when we mount them in the laboratory. Number one being the thickness. As I mentioned, you want to have the patient bite down. You want to have them bite down actually pretty firmly, I would say, to try and get the material as thin as possible, but also to seat the dentition as best as possible. Part of the reason for that is if you have too thick of an impression, it creates a problem. The left-hand side here, you'll see this model that's been poured up. Based on the impression thickness, we know that if you have a very thick impression, these two models will not be touching. They have a very thick amount of material in here. And when they pour both sides of the impression up, they then mount it with this disposal articulator type of device. And the first time they open your articulator is to pull out the impression. Well, knowing that you had some space in here, whether it's half a millimeter or two millimeters, when they close this back down, the bite record is different than the patient's dentition. That's an instant problem for you to either have to adjust occlusion or have your occlusion out of, uh, out of centric. Uh, so that's a problem. So we notice here that the rotational aspect of these types in red is entirely different than a natural dentition, which would be more like in the yellow. So when pulling something out of here, knowing that this is going to have to close down a little bit, knowing that the rotation is different, you're going to have some given errors just from the word go. Uh, so trying to avoid that is one reason maybe to think twice about using closed bite trays all the time. Furthermore, as I mentioned, very flat dentition is because of this. We can't do proper excursive movements. So you can't place the buccal and lingual grooves and or the contours of the crowns, in the, or not crowns, the cusps in the right position. Uh, hence, most of the restorations coming back are fairly flat or out of occlusion. I also mentioned taking a bite registration. Bite registration is extremely important when you're doing closed bite trays, especially if you're using a closed bite tray for a single posterior tooth, the most distal tooth. I mentioned that's a contraindication, but sometimes, you know, based on tori or limited openings, sometimes you have to use a closed bite tray. Notice in this one, when it closes down, there is not enough space. If you've given the lab a bite registration, now they can utilize that to make sure they have proper mounting, which would probably be hand articulation. So I would say with any closed bite tray, I would typically make some type of rigid bite registration. I typically use Delar wax. Now, if you take a full arch impression, obviously you still don't have ideal um, movements, but at least you can get a perfect centric stop. So at this point, at least taking a full arch tray with an opposing gives you substantially better accuracy, albeit excursive functions are still lacking compared to maybe a semi-adjustable articulator or the movement of a traditional patient. Now, in looking at this, even though we're not on a hinge axis, when using semi-adjustable articulators, we know that we're at least being close to the proper movements of that patient, whether it be an excursive or maybe uh, protrusive functions. And so by being that much closer, even though not being perfect, you have a lot better chances of, of doing minimal adjustments, if any, simply because of having a different tool being implemented. And so when I hear people say that a closed bite tray is faster, I would disagree. And so I would say most of the time adjustment at seating may take longer unless the lab has purposely built it out of occlusion. And I would say 99% of the time, things are out of occlusion. And so with something like this, you can have things in good occlusion and not have to adjust or minimal adjustments. And let's face it, protrusive adjustments, labs can't do these with closed bite trays. So again, keeping that in mind based on the type of restoration you're doing, sometimes you need to gravitate towards those full arch trays. And once you've taken your impression, the assistant can take the face bow and the opposing. So there's no additional time or burden on the dentist. You're off to the next patient. Uh, but there's obviously a big difference in technique of what you're delivering based on the type of tray you're implementing, as you can see here. Now, if you are going to use full arch trays, there's a lot of different ones on the market. We probably all use these. The metal stock ones that have the perforations are a nightmare to clean. Hence, most of us don't want to use those. The plastic disposable ones have a little bit of flex or distortion and uh, you know don't necessarily fit every patient, so they're a bit of a pain as well. I love rimlock trays, even though I don't use them much anymore. The reason I like the rimlock trays, which is shown in the lower right-hand corner, is because they have the ability to force material only in one direction, up into the sulcus and the vestibules around the teeth. So it's forcing materials around the teeth. And so with this type of system, I'm typically using a light body or medium body impression material in my syringe and a heavy body uh, to drive the material down around the teeth. So in using stock trays, 
you'll notice on the left hand side if you pick one size tray it may not fit well in the posterior part of the mouth but fit perfect everywhere everywhere else now if you choose the next size up now you have a very large tray that does fit but you have a lot of extra material that you're going to waste and you're going to have a lot more distortion in that material and let's face it a patient doesn't want a mouthful of material so you'll notice here from the back the difference between maybe a large and a medium sized tray so it's difficult to get the ideal fit Obviously, a custom impression tray is the best, but it's time consuming and or is an additional cost that we don't want to have. But if you are using a custom impression tray uh, for a full arch impression for maybe um, doing a full arch of dentistry, uh, like a, a full mouth rehabilitation, there is nothing that compares as far as the accuracy. So keep that in mind if you're doing bigger cases. Sometimes it's worth that additional investment. But I will say there's a great product that mimics a custom tray. It's this one here by Clinician's Choice. It's known as the Heat Wave Tray. And the nice thing about this is that in a water bath at 158 degrees in a minute, these become pliable because they're thermoplastic. So you can adapt these to a model. You can adapt it to the patient's mouth. And in doing so, you get a virtually custom fit. Uh, you can also just take a cup of water out of a microwave and use that if you don't have a water bath. But by getting a better fit, you're using less material. They, they claim 30% less material, which is great. So you're saving on impression materials, but you're also getting better accuracy because it's thinner and more accurate. Uh, so in looking at uh, which tray to use, they have a, a caliper that allows you to size the dentition, whether it's in the mouth or on a model, so you can select the appropriate size tray. Once you've chosen it, many of the trays will fit quite well, but sometimes they won't. And that's the nice thing about being pliable. You can see here, the second molars don't fit, so I stick it in a water bath, and uh, after a minute, it becomes pliable, and I can adapt it to the existing model or the patient's dentition. You'll notice here, not only did I change the posterior tooth, but I also changed the entire buccal corridor, and I pushed the palate up into it. So again, very thin amount of material that's going to wrap around the entire arch to be very accurate. But at the same time, since these trays aren't perforated, it's going to force the material up around the teeth. Uh, so you'll notice here, a very thin amount of material having been used. This was a, a veneer case. And so in using those, uh, it's almost never that I have a remake simply because of the application of the material being forced around the teeth, the accuracy of the impression tray helping out substantially. And let's face it, impression materials are still being used by the majority of us in various types of trays. They make up 85 to 90 percent of the market. Uh, most of us are using vinyl polysiloxanes. Uh, polyethers are still out there being used by some, but they have a few drawbacks, you know, taste and smell, etc. Vinyl siloxane ethers are kind of a newer product that combines some of the, the benefits of polyethers and vinyl polysiloxanes together. So you have a lot of different products out there to choose from. Obviously, some of the least expensive ones being the VPS system, uh, and there's numerous ones to choose from. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but as I mentioned earlier, ADA says that pretty much all of them meet their standards and are rated as excellent. Uh, so it really boils down to you know, price and, and handling and your choice, along with a couple other minor details we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, some people ask about digital impressions. We're not going to talk about it tonight, but that's 10 to 15% of the market, and it's growing. And there's numerous different ones out there, and they continue to grow. Think about these. I think they're phenomenal tools. Uh, they're a fair amount of an investment. The only thing they still won't do for us is the most important thing. They still require tissue management. You still have to retract the cord or retract the tissue with cords and paste and lasers. You still have to manage bleeding. I'm here to tell you that these products will change. Probably within the next five to ten years, you'll have something that can look through tissues and moisture. And so once that becomes available, yeah, I think everyone will make a huge jump away from materials. But let's face it, impression materials are very inexpensive. Uh, these can be in inexpensive when extrapolated over time. I just don't see the value for me personally yet in utilizing them being that they don't address tissue management but if you can do tissue management well it's amazing what these can deliver for you and they can certainly speed up the process and give you a fabulous result but just don't be fooled about tissue management you still have to be good at it so in pressure materials we need them to be dimensionally stable we need good flowability and wettability wettability being key along with that flow high tear strength and elastic recovery is critical in those undercuts and narrow areas between teeth and having good detail reproduction, less than 25 microns, is also very advantageous, as well as non-slumping. Let's face it, we don't want a light body or extra light body that's going to slump and run down the back of the throat. 
And there's a lot of different products on the market. We all have different ones we've been using for various reasons. I've used all of these and I probably still have all of these in my practice. Um, you know, they all can work great if you're good at handling tissues and if you're good at creating excellent preparation designs. So from there, what makes it a little more easy with these is based on the type of viscosity you want, uh, how you're going to adapt it to which type of tray, how fast you want it to set up, and how much money you want to spend. And from there, some extra little bells and whistles that can make life easier is how they lay down on the tooth. You know, how much easier does one lay down on the tooth than another, maybe even in a wet environment. And that's where I've been very impressed with this Splash Max. And so obviously Denmat sponsoring us tonight. I've been privileged to use this material for the last few months. And as one of the evaluators for Catapult, uh, I can honestly tell you that myself and many of the KOL speakers for Catapult found, to be, found this to be very impressive. We were quite surprised to see how excellent this material handles. And so I've used this in numerous different cases where I have a lot of moisture and bleeding occurring. And I'm here to tell you, I haven't missed an impression yet. Uh, so it, it's a VPS impression material. It offers very good hydrophilicity. It has one of the lowest contact angles almost immediately compared to any other product on the market, which is nice uh, that it lays down that fast to give us immediate results. It has very good wet, wet ability and high tear strength and elasticity. It has excellent accuracy and it has really nice color contrasts. So you'll notice here on this slide, this is an independent test showing Splash Max from Denmat versus Aquasil Ultra XLV and Imprint 3, which are two excellent products. Don't get me wrong, they can work very well. But notice here how life might be a little bit easier with this particular product. See how the water droplet on this particular slide over anywhere from 0 to 30 seconds, how the content angle of that water droplet starts to change and become almost flat by the time it gets done compared to the competitors. Basically what that's allowing your impression material to do is adapt to that tooth that much e easier, especially in a moist environment, which let's face it, that's where we're working. We want something that works better in a wet environment. Splash Max does that. Denmet did a fabulous job in coming up with this. Uh, so this is my go-to product for the last couple months, uh, and I've been documenting all this, and I I'm here to tell you I'm quite impressed with what they've come up with. From there, as I told you, I'm a big fan, and I'm kind of weird this way, but I like a medium body because I like to force it down into the sulcus uh, along with a heavy body in a tray. Um, occasionally, I use a light body. That's typically for veneers where I don't need a lot of pressure or movement, uh, but they also make an extra light for those of you that like a little bit lighter material. And you can see here they don't slump. They do a very good job. So as I mentioned, a lot of different wonderful aspects as far as the wettability, the contact angle, the tear strength, and the accuracy. But the other nice thing is having different set times, anywhere from 2.15 to 4.30, based on if you're taking maybe a quadrant or a full arch, uh, you have different time sets available to you, which is quite nice. From there, you can see the colors have very high contrast, which makes it easy to read. Um, and if you look at price point compared to most of the manufacturers, you can see Denmet's done a great job to bring this in at a lower price, uh, but still handles as good, if not better, than its competitors. So. Like many of you out there, I want to spend less money and, and have a great return on the investment and have a great product to utilize. So I can tell you Denmet has done a great job with Splash Max. So here's a few different cases I did over one week. Uh, obviously, I've got numerous different impressions, but these are just everyday stuff that I've used uh, this material for. And again, as I mentioned, I like the medium viscosity, hence it's blue on the purple. And so you can see a, you know, a closed bite triple tray on the trio dent tray uh, for a single posterior tooth. You can see an implant pickup. Uh, you can see in this particular case, I was showing the fit results that I was getting back from the laboratory. You know, really nice, accurate fit on my, my restorations. Uh, moving to the anterior dentition, doing single teeth as well as Maryland bridges, various types of cosmetic cases. Uh, worked quite well. Uh, right hand side, again, a custom adapted heat wave tray to get that posterior molar. You can see I flowed the material across the occlusal aspect of the teeth to capture all the detail so that the lab has a better model without bubbles in it. This is the case using that Maryland bridge and the anterior single tooth. So you can you know, imagine that we have circular fluids coming into this area, uh, not only from the bridge prepared teeth, but also from the single unit and to make very good accurate margins for the laboratory so I can get great restorations back to make life easier for us. Uh, this material is able to accomplish that. My cosmetic cases, you know, going in here packing cord at the beginning of the case, like I mentioned, doing your ideal reduction, having healthy tissues, retrieving the cord, not having bleeding from our technique, placing these materials in there. In this case, as I mentioned, I use light body 
for my veneers quite regularly. So you can see that this is the green light body having been used over the occlusal surface, extending into the posterior dentition to make sure my models articulate extremely well. And so again, this is the Splash Max product. And here's our final restorations. So common errors, there's numerous different ones, bubbles, tears, voids, distortion. A lot of different things can arise. We've talked about a few of them. A couple other things I would tell you to add into the mix. These, tip, these two tips from Clinician Choice, you can put these onto the existing uh, impression guns, whether it be Denmats, uh, Splash Max, or other products. These little tips work quite nice to flow material right into the sulcus uh, that allow you to put force behind the material to, to pressurize it down into the sulcus as well. And so whether you have cord or you don't have cord, these can be utilized for certain techniques, which is nice. I will say anytime you're injecting material, make sure that wherever your starting point is, that you go past your starting point with your material. So for an example, if you start, let's say here on the facial uh, mesial line angle and you extend around the tooth, when you get back to where you had started, go past that a little bit. You'll find that you'll have less problems, less drags and draws in this area. Uh, so a little caveat to throw in there. If you find that you have problems like this on the margin, maybe a little bubble or void, uh, maybe you're using air to blow the material down around the tooth. I know John Coyce loves doing that. He's a great clinician and gets wonderful results. And that can be used any time. Just be careful that if you are using that too heavily that you might incorporate air along your margins. Be careful of that. Uh, furthermore, if we have various types of contaminants and you're blowing air on it, you might get some of these materials to pop up onto the margin. So be careful where you're directing the air flow. Uh, make sure you rinse things away completely. And if you place any type of resin materials, you may have an air inhibition layer that will inhibit your resins from hardening to completion. We know that cords can rebound. Make sure your cords are down, uh, placed very well, or utilize a laser in those areas where maybe your cord can't be placed well enough so you don't have to worry about a cord rebounding. We know that things like this can happen based on the setting times of material and based on the time of starting uh, your impression delivery. If the assistant's delivering material into the tray while you're delivering into the mouth, you want to make sure you're both delivering at the same amount of time so they seat together so that they can be mixed together. You'll notice here that these materials don't have a seamless integration. And because of that, there's probably some level of distortion here. Maybe you have a smaller die in the laboratory, meaning that your restoration is going to be a little narrower and may not fit when you get it back from the laboratory. The other thing is based on temperature. Uh, obviously, you're working in a very hot, humid environment. These materials will set faster. Be cognizant of that also. If you see something like this, and I have had one of these happen, go ahead and just take a new impression because you won't know that it's distorted until you get it back from the lab. And I tried it once, and I'll never do it again. <clears throat> obviously, you need good hemostasis. This is an impression that can be sent to a laboratory, but the lab's not going to be able to know what to do with it. You have to have good hemostasis. You need a good tray. Obviously, trays that lack the ability to capture the material and hold it against the teeth, such as this one, are not going to give you a good result. Examples like this, where maybe the patient bit down or moved or maybe delivered the tray at an angle and you got drags. You want to make sure to deliver the impression material straight down on the teeth and you want the patient to bite down firmly. You always want to try that tray in before doing the procedure to make sure the patient is able to bite down well. Uh, once they have that extra material on there, it becomes a little more challenging. So you want to make sure you try it before implementing the material on it. From there, you want to make sure they bite firmly. By biting firmly, you get these little tiny perforations that you can see through. That's going to give you the best accuracy when they go and pour up these models. If you're not having that, you're going to find your models don't come together as well. So keep that in mind. This is what you want to see, obviously, when the patient bites down. So whether you're doing single units such as this, taking off existing restorations, doing ideal preparations, whether it's equigingival or subgingival or supergingival, placing the various types of cords and astringents we talked about, using maybe the splash max and the various types of tips I mentioned and the heat wave trays, you can make great looking restorations that are in function at eight microns of accuracy. You can extend that into multiple restorations when you're using these materials and techniques to give you wonderful restorations that fit well that don't need adjustment or minimal adjustment. And you can extrapolate these techniques into full arch dentistry where you can implement all the same techniques just over more teeth to give you great accuracy and precision so that you can fabricate perfect models and great restorations that require minimal to no adjustment. 
that you can deliver these faster and easier by taking a couple extra steps and some time. And in doing so, it makes life that much easier for you and that much easier for the patient. And I think it's going to give you a lot better result. So you can see in all of these that I've implemented many of the same techniques I talked about all the way through. And you can see the type of dentistry that we can perform when doing these techniques. So any one of us can deliver this type of accuracy and detail any day in our practice. And so with that being said, to get a perfect impression, you first need that healthy periodontium. Then you need a great preparation, wonderful tissue management, selecting the right type of tray or customizable tray, and then picking a great impression material to work with. From there, if I can help with anything at all, feel free to, to contact me. I have people from all over the world writing me, whether it be on Facebook or my personal email, asking me questions about different products and techniques. Uh, I do lecture for numerous different manufacturers uh, all around the world, and I write articles for many of them as well. Uh, so I'm always happy to help out and give you my feedback as to what's working with me and what's been shown or proven in research to work as well. Uh, so feel free to get a hold of me at any one of these different types of social media or email or phone numbers. With that being said, I want to thank every one of you for coming out tonight. It's at this point. We've got about another 12 to 15 minutes of Q&A should there be any additional questions. Ah, first question comes in. Great question. Can you use the piezo for final prep? Uh, I use the piezo for my final prepping of the margins. Yes, that is one place that I use it. So if I have a traditional air handpiece being utilized, an air turbine, uh, after doing my gross reduction of 95% of the tooth structure, if I want to drop that margin down that last little bit to finalize my margin and finalize my preparation at the margin, I will go to this particular device. That doesn't mean to say you can't use it on the whole tooth. If you want to smooth out the entire tooth after doing gross reduction, you can totally use the piezo. It works fabulous for that. It makes a very nice, smooth uh, preparation based on if you're choosing a coarse diamond or fine diamond. Uh, highly recommend it. It's a very cool tool to have. Now, granted, most of the time I'm using my, uh, my Sycan electric hand pieces, but I do have one operatory that I use occasionally, and that one doesn't have electrics, and that's when I utilize this particular product. As far as which tips do I implement, uh, as you saw, that, that was a picture of all of my tips. So I have knife edge tips, I have large chamfer and small chamfer, and I have a shoulder burr also. So the shoulder burr being for lithium disilicate products, uh, and the chamfer burrs for more of the zirconia and PFM type products. And from there, I showed you a couple of the veneer style burrs that were kind of like a, a well, I should say inserts. It looks like a burr cut in half. Those are the ones that I will use interproximately, maybe in the lower anteriors. If I'm doing full crown in the lower anterior or a veneer where I don't want to hit the adjacent tooth, that's where I'll use those particular tips. Uh, great questions. Thank you. Next question comes in, what diode laser do I personally use? <laughs> Since I lecture on lasers also, I have had a slew of lasers. I have used every laser from every manufacturer, uh, I believe to date, um, that's been introduced in the United States. Um, so whether it be uh, Denmat's Envy, I have that one personally. I have AMDs. Um, I've had Cavos. I've had Ivoclars. Uh, I have a CO2 laser currently from, well, I still have it. I've had it for about six years from DECA. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big laser fan. I, I think they're phenomenal. Anyone who doesn't have one is just amazing what you're missing out on. And for the price point being as low as they are, uh, and to be able to implement it anywhere in the mouth when you're having bleeding or tissue problems, whether it's direct restorations or indirect restorations or periodontal therapy. I mean, you can use this consistently throughout your day with many of the different people in your office. Uh, highly recommend implementing lasers. Make sure you go out and take a look at them if you're not using one currently. Uh, great question to ask. So, yeah, so I'm currently using AMDs and Denmats. Got about another five, six minutes if anyone else has additional questions. Ah, uh, you know what? Someone posted a question in the chat. Um, you're welcome. Uh, someone said, thanks for the lecture. You know, you're, you're more than welcome. Happy to spend my time with you. Uh, why on certain types of impressions do I use medium with a heavy and others I use light with a heavy? Great question. And I probably should have talked about that more. Um, I'm... I'm a little different. Again, I try not to cause any tissue damage, and usually I'll pack a single cord. Um, but I'm here to tell you, and I've shown many of the people in my study clubs, 
that uh, if you use the right tray and you have a heavy enough viscosity, uh, heavy body material, you can take a medium body in a syringe and squirt that material into a sulcus, a healthy sulcus that's not bleeding or irritated. You can squirt it in there without ever retracting tissue and force the heavy body down on top of it and get tissue retraction to see that margin. And depending on the, the type of tissue and the depth of the sulcus, you know, I've seen some of the materials go down a couple millimeters and some go down only half a millimeter. You only need about half a millimeter to a millimeter uh, along that margin for it to be accurate enough for a laboratory to be able to, to reduce the dye. So I've used that for many of my cases over the years and it's worked quite well for me. That being said, a medium viscosity in the anterior dentition for very thin preparations oftentimes can get pushed off of the veneer preparation. And when it gets pushed off, you'll sometimes get a line. And so for that reason, I use light bodies typically for my veneers in the anterior dentition if they're minimally invasive veneers. If I do a heavy reduction veneer for something like a lithium disilicate, uh, you know, like or uh, um, you know, like an a Empress or an Emax, uh, those types of products where you do heavier reduction, then I would go to my medium viscosity. So that's why I'm typically using medium in the majority of my stuff. Furthermore, if I've reduced tissue with my laser. I don't have to go back and pack a cord and I find that I have to do less tissue reduction to get the medium to work versus the light body doesn't have the same kind of pressure to force behind it. Um, it's just in the technique of displacing less tissue in my technique. Great question to ask. I'm glad I could answer that for you. Uh, next question is, do you have any experience with Aquasil cordless? Yes, as I told you, I've used everything out there. I have Aquasil cordless in my office. I was one of the beta testers with um, that product, and I can honestly tell you that's a fabulous product. Uh, it does work quite well. The only drawback which I find with it is you have the ability to do a limited number of teeth based on the digit cartridges that go into this system. And so the, the largest case I've done with it so far was a six unit anterior veneer case. So if you're doing a single tooth or, or just a, like two or three teeth in a quadrant, yeah, it works great. Um, I would say if you're an office that does more like larger cases such as mine, then it becomes a little bit, uh, uh, it doesn't work as well simply because you can't do as many teeth. And, and so I find that to be the only drawback I have with the product. Otherwise it's a really nice product. Obviously it's going to run you a little more money uh, than using you know something like uh, Denmat Splash Max, uh, but it does a nice job of being able to squirt the material down into the sulcus. Uh, that being said, I showed you those two tips. I think you can use those tips on many of the other devices out there and get a similar type of uh, reaction. Maybe not the same, but very similar. Uh, so great question to ask. What other questions come to mind? So we've got about another three minutes here, and then we'll, we'll call it a night, and I'm going to go home and have some dinner. Ah, articulators and face bow from Dr. Gomez. Um, I have a personal favorite, semi-adjustable articulators. If we're talking semi-adjustable, I like the SAM articulators. I, I use the SAM 3. I like it because of the centric occlusal lock that it has compared to uh, some of the other ones on the market. Um, I like the ability for it to be a little more difficult to take the upper member off the lower member. Uh, the reason for that being is I don't want any movement and I don't want uh, any parts being lost. From there, uh, I don't use um, I don't use magnet plates uh, because magnets, although they are, are fairly accurate, there's a, a small amount of level of movement that could arise, and I don't want to have any chance for any errors. I'm extremely picky about you know a couple microns off in accuracy. Uh, so the SAM3 is my favorite go-to. Uh, as far as semi-adjustable. As far as fully adjustable articulators, um, if, uh, if you have the SAM3, uh, you have the ability to attach a electronic face bow, which is pretty amazing, uh, that they came out with more recently. Uh, Cavo has a fully adjustable articulator with a fully electronic face bow, which is pretty amazing also for finding hinge axis, but it's not available in the States. You'd have to buy it out of the States first. So as far as all the different Articulators, if I was going fully adjustable, I'm a, a big fan of the old-fashioned Stuart articulators and full panographic tracings. That tells you how anal and weird I am as far as my level of accuracy. But uh, Tom Basta at the Face Institute in Northern California, uh, they have their own articulators. They have a semi-adjustable and a fully adjustable. 
phenomenal tools. I highly recommend those particular products and I highly recommend the FACE Institute for phenomenal occlusion lectures and programs. I attribute a lot of my success in full arch dentistry and quadrant dentistry to their teachings, which is what I still preach today and what I use every day in my practice. Uh, we should have an occlusion lecture on things that they've taught me that made life easy. Uh, so yeah, SAM3 is what I use for semi-adjustable, fully adjustable. Uh, I use the Tom Basta face uh, articulator. Uh, let's see, someone else uh, wrote in, missed the first three minutes of my lecture. I'm sorry, they did record it for anyone that wants to go back and watch it again. It, it'll be on Catapult. Uh, did I discuss depth cuts? I didn't. That would go more into uh, you know the different preparation techniques. Um, but as far as the burrs that I use for depth cuts, I did show my burr block, and I have three different chamfer burrs that I use. Based on the thickness of each one, or the overall diameter of each one of those burrs, I know that if you cut that diameter in half, I can sink that burr halfway into the tooth, and I know exactly how much reduction I've obtained. Now, the other thing that I use for like veneers, and I have a great series on it, um, showing how I depth reduction, depth do, sorry, do depth reduction for anterior teeth, where I want like two tenths of a millimeter or three tenths of a of, uh, reduction. I use some special burrs uh, out of the San Fernando Valley, and I'm blanking on their name right now. You have my email below here. If you want to write me, I'll run into the other room and uh, shoot you back an email with it. Uh, but they are hands down the best depth cutting burrs I have ever used, and I've been using them for 25 years, and I have never seen anyone get close to the, what they can do. Uh, they have this special safe edge barrel on them uh, that allows you to cut the exact amount you want to weigh and nothing else. Uh, so I couldn't say enough about that particular product. Um, compared to some of the other ones on the market. I, I can't say that anything compares to this. So depth reduction, when you're doing cosmetic cases, this particular product is hands down the best in my mind. Uh, but otherwise, in the back of the mouth for crowns, uh, again, I use the normal uh, diameter of a burr, knowing how much reduction I have with that, or you're sinking half the burr into the tooth, I know how much reduction I can obtain. And that's why my burr block from Brasser has those burrs in it, because that's how I like to implement them. Uh, so great question, and feel free to write me back if you want the name or anyone write me back uh, for the name of that, that uh, burr system I use for doing depth, re depth cut reduction. Uh, we could actually make a preparation lecture too. There's a lot of wonderful things you could do in there in preparation. Um, and like I said, occlusion and registrations are phenomenal too. There's so many great things there. So it just means we got to get together again and do this all over again with Catapult. And so with that being said, I think I'm at my limit at, seven, uh, at quarter after the hour. Uh, so thank you again for everyone coming out tonight. Really appreciate all the feedback and Q&A. It's a lot of fun to, to present with you all. Uh, thanks again. I look forward to hearing from all of you and seeing you again on Catapult with future programs. Good night. If there are no additional questions, I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight's program. Once again, I want to remind you to return to the classroom in Catapult University for the CE quiz. CE certificates will be emailed to each participant following the program and following taking the quiz. And once again, we'd like to thank Dr. Snyder and our program sponsor, DenMat. We hope to see you again for future programs. Thank you, and good night.